then we formulate some estimator phi tilde phi, which is our guess of the true parameter value phi. And then we can ask the question how well we can do it. So we want to minimize somehow the, the variance or the square deviation of the estimator from the true value and minimize it over measurements, estimators, and input states. Okay, so this is the quantum tunnel estimation problem, which is at the heart of quantum theoretical quantum metrology. Okay, let's say. Okay, and one of the tools is the so-called Fisher information. So Fisher information appears in the classical Fisher information appears in the classical kramer rao inequality, which tells you that if you have a probabilistic model where measurement results i are obtained <coughs> according to the probabilities that depends on the parameter value phi, you can ask what is the optimal uh, estimator phi tilde, which we assume is unbiased, which, it, which means it tracks the true parameter uh, properly. And then uh, we can prove that Whatever estimator we choose in such a probabilistic model, whatever unbiased estimator, its variance will be always lower bounded by 1 over f, where f is the Fisher information. And this is the quantity that depends on this probability distribution, basically how fast this probability distribution changes with phi. So this is the derivative squared der uh, derivative here, responsible for this. And OK, and that's the classical story of Fisher information. And then we have quantum version, which, which tells us that if actually this probabilistic model appears as a result of maybe, maybe I will use this, what, this spotlight. Okay, so this probabilistic model results in measurements on quantum state. Uh, Rafa, we can also see your mouse cursor, so now we see both okay. laser and cursor, just saying. Okay, but yeah, I think maybe it's good, no? <laughs> okay, anyway. Actually, so the laser simple. lags after the mouse, so yeah. <laughs> okay. it, it doesn't look the best, yeah. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> Okay, okay, so I, I may turn off this. Uh, how to turn off? Okay, uh, okay, anyway. So we have probability distribution that depends on this phi obtained from measurement of quantum state that depends on phi, for example, by unitary encoding. And then we can um, calculate quantity, which is called quantum Fisher information, which, which is a function of the state and its derivatives. So phi, this psi dots are derivatives of quantum state. And then it tells us the quantum version of kramer rao inequality that whatever measurement we choose, and as and unbiased estimators, we cannot get a better estimation than one over quantum Fisher information. The divides. Okay. So for people who don't know these things, the best intuition is to remember that basically for unitary encoding, like when encoding of the parameter is in the form e to minus i some generator, for example, you can think Hamiltonian and t, you can think that the parameter is time then basically for such an encoding, this quantum kramer rao inequality amounts to time energy uncertainty relation because, <coughs> sorry, because the Fisher information from the above formula is just four times the variance of the generator of this uh, encoding, of this unitary encoding. And then the quantum kramer rao inequality tells us that the estimator of time, the variance of this estimator is lower bounded by one over four times variance of the Hamilton on the state. Okay? Good. Any questions? Okay. What? It's okay. Good. We're good, yeah. <laughs> so good. Then uh, we can now move a bit to this uh, more sophisticated situation. 
So we consider some elementary channels. So like, for example, single qubit and unitary encoding. So rotation of the block sphere by, by angle phi around the axis. And we can ask what happens if we have n such channels. And then we can either send uh, states of the qubits in uncorrelated way. So each state goes through its own channel and the measurements are also independent and so on. Or we can say like, we can consider like entanglement enhanced scheme where we send arbitrary entangled state and we measure it in a collective way. And we can ask what is the quantum Fisher information in such scenarios, what we can do. And it's very easy to show that in this uncorrelated scheme, it's optimal to send the state that just lies on the equator of the block sphere. And Fisher information for this state is one. And if we have n such channels, so effectively a product state of n qubits, the Fisher information is n because of the property that Fisher information is quantum Fisher information is additive on product states. Okay, and then we, for this entanglement enhanced scheme, we can consider this entangled state, this DAZ state, which is superposition of all zeros and ones, and it gives us n squared. Okay, <clears throat> but then we, we will move to something more sophisticated. So we, we also want to consider something that is most general, and the most general uh, use of n channels so we, we are given n uses of this channel u phi, and we want to estimate this parameter phi as well as we can. So the most general scheme is this adaptive scheme, which is depicted here, where we can use arbitrary number of ancillas and some control unitaries in between, and then we measure some collective measurements in the end. <coughs> this is more general than this parallel scheme I presented before. And in principle, it allows to encode such strategies that we, we measure something um, on, the, on the way, and depending on the measurement results, we change the state that goes to the next unitaries. How to see this? Since we have arbitrary number of ancillas, we can think that one ancilla goes untouched to the measurement, and the measurement results effectively make some conditional operation V conditional on the measurement result we perform in the end. But if nothing happens in between, we can think that this measurement result effectively happened earlier. Okay, so then we can encode this conditional operation. Anyway, for this simple unitary encoding schemes, there is no real benefit from such adaptive schemes. And you can prove that the maximum Fisher information, if you maximize over all these adaptive schemes, is the same as with this GHZ state. Okay? It's n squared. Or even worse, it's the same if you just send a single qubit through n gates sequentially. Okay? So, so you just apply u phi and times, and you also have n squared. Fisher information for estimating phi. Um, sorry about that. Just a quick question. What about those like Bayesian schemes? Now it came to my mind that people studied this. In this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Of course. So, uh, so this is very simplified uh, picture because we just use Fisher. So now, if you use uh, if you use the Bayesian scheme, uh, it's more subtle because uh, you have like the amount of resources. Okay, maybe like this. Here we speak about Fisher, but we don't really discuss achievability of this. Yes. So that's the problem with this kind of uh, formulation. We can show that the Fisher is optimal, but it doesn't mean we know how to achieve this in a single shot experiment, for example, okay? With Bayesian scheme, uh, formalism is a bit more difficult, but then in the end, you really know what you can achieve. So, so okay, to put things short, uh, we can also prove that asymptotically in Bayesian scheme, this adaptiveness is not useful. 
in with, if we have no noise okay and this was actually also a bit recent result of ours uh, on this pi corrected heisenberg limit okay where we first where we first show that adaptiveness actually gives you the same as parallel schemes effectively uh, okay yeah so but then things are more subtle because you you cannot achieve like one over n precision uh, rigorously okay. but this is a different story here it would not be important for our talk today <laughs> so things become interesting when we take into account the coherence so our unitary encoding is changed to some uh, quantum channel completely positive map or something like this depending on parameter phi okay so for example we can think that it has some Krauss representation with Krauss operators depending on parameter phi so for example you can think that this is an interferometer with added loss okay or a qubit rotation with added dephasing or something like this so for example in these two examples the structure is very simple because this Krauss operators can be represented like Krauss operator represented uh, responsible for noise times unitary so this is quite simple structure where parameter encoding and noise can be somehow separated it's not always the case but okay it's often the case at least in the simplest examples and you can you can understand a lot by thinking only about such uh, model that we have unitary times noise okay <laughs> so now we again uh, consider this most general adaptive scheme and now the question is very non-trivial and we ask if we maximize this quantum fissure information over all input states and this control operations v can we achieve this n squared scaling like this heisenberg scaling or just this standard scaling like n proportional to n okay and and this is a difficult question because quantum fissure information for mixed states <laughs> so the state you have when you have the coherence it's not so easy to calculate compared with pure state case so you have the formula which okay i don't i will not go into because we don't need it but basically is some formula that you can calculate to calculate it you need to perform eigen decomposition of your states raw and this is numerically doable but it's difficult to get some analytical simple formulas and for example to to prove something in general what are the bounds and so on okay that's why <coughs> you have to do some more clever things and there is one very nice property of quantum fisher information for mixed states that actually if you consider purifications of your mixed states surely a purification contains more information than the mixed state itself but it's interesting that there always exists some purification which contains exactly the same information as the mixed state okay so if you minimize over all purifications of your mixed state <coughs> or actually i should say of your family of mixed states because we don't deal with a single mixed state we deal with some parameter dependent family of mixed states at least some we need some neighborhood of of a given phi yes so we need a state and its derivative to calculate fisher information so we need some small shifts of our parameter to calculate things so when we consider purifications we also consider these purifications in a sense of a state and some shift small shift and this property is actually quite helpful in deriving bounds because if we are clever and we are able to find a nice purification i mean informative purification so purification which is not very far from this true fisher information we can get a quite tight bounds 
on our mixed state Fisher information. Okay. And, and this was basically the idea behind the bounds that have been derived many for over 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 a couple of years. <laughs> and basically these bounds are derived using the trick that we write quantum Fisher information in terms of Krauss operators of our channel. And then consider different purifications of this evolution, which corresponds to choosing different Krauss representations of the channel, which I depict, which I write here in this way, so that we have some Krauss representation tilde, which is a transformed Krauss representation from some canonical Krauss representation with, uh, with coefficients that are taken from the unitary matrix V which may depend on the parameter, okay? So, so you know that the CP map is, has different Krauss representations, equivalent, yes? Which are connected by some unitary. <clears throat> and we can also make this unitary dependent on the parameter we are interested in. And th this makes things interesting because this, like, allows us to probe some non-trivially differing purifications of our channel that give us really different quantum Fisher information. Okay, so, so symbolically in a, in, a, in a like compact notation, this is written here. So now with bold K, I understand a vector of Krauss operator, okay? Okay, and using these tricks without, I mean, I don't show the derivations because this is just an overview. So these are the references that led to, to, to this bound. We get a bound on the maximal quantum Fisher information you can get from such schemes if you are using your channel n times and allow for our arbitrary adaptive strategy. And this bound is very powerful because it contains objects, this alpha and beta. These are some operators that just depend on like a single channel Krauss operators. Okay, so, so they are easy to compute. And then these this norms are operator norms of this object. So you basically have two objects, alpha and beta. And there is one term that scales linearly with n, and there is another term that scales quadratically with n. Okay? And now the question whether there is Heisenberg scaling or not amounts to a question, can you put beta equal zero? So can you find a Krauss representation for which beta is equal to zero, okay? So to be more specific, okay, you can, we can write this beta. Uh, why, uh, there, there should be no sum, sorry, uh, because I already have this vector notation. So there is no sum here. Okay. Uh, so how to how do, to express this beta? So we consider these rotations of Krauss representation, and actually, because uh, everything just depends on Krauss operators and their derivatives, <laughs> we may focus at some particular value of phi. And for simplicity, let it be phi equals zero, okay? And if we just focus at phi equals zero, and we just care about the Krauss operators and their first derivatives, without loss of generality, we can consider this unitary matrix to be some fixed unitary matrix times some e to i h phi, okay? So we like consider just the unitary matrix to be to give us the most general like first order shift yes so so just just consider the generator okay oh, okay maybe i should i could also write it that we just approximated that by one minus plus i h phi and we don't care about higher orders in phi but i okay, i prefer to write it like this because it's unitary um sorry can i have just some uh, okay I'm not sure if this is the right question, but so yes. this analysis seems to be like, uh, so you like perform this analysis in the vicinity of like every phi independently and your purifications are sort of chosen then. 
kind of they, they are adjusted to the true value of the, of the yes okay okay yes yes because okay this is like the most optimistic bound yes we assume that we could in principle have different uh, measurement strategies for different files yes um, <laughs> so if we have a bound in this approach this bound will also be valid in some less optimistic approaches if we when we for example say we want to have the same strategy working for all files or something like this so so if we derive the bound with this strategy it will be very strong bound anyway if we put this phi equals zero we can write this beta and this beta is very simple because it's then this derivative of this k tilde with this transformation will amount to derivative of original k minus ihk yes this is just this shift this is the small change in this uh cross operators dagger times k okay and now we ask, can we can we make it zero? So making it zero means i k dot dagger k should be equal to k dagger h k, where h is some Hermitian matrix. Okay. In other words, it means uh, it amounts to the question: Is this operator i k dot dagger k within sorry within the span the Hermitian span of k i dagger k j? For all ij, do you do you agree that this is uh, sorry, that this is so? Yes. Okay. So, for example, for the class of models I was mentioning before, where our Krauss operator is some noisy channel times unitary encoding, this object k dot dagger k is just Hamiltonian k dagger k and k dagger k is identity because of CP trace of trace preserving pro, uh, property of the channel. So it's just Hamiltonian. Okay. So so this condition then basically means Heisenberg scaling is impossible if our Hamiltonian generating our transformations within the span of k i dagger k. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So, for example, you can ask the question is it typical that we can have this beta zero? And actually, it is typical. For example, you can always do this construction if your channel is full rank. Okay, full rank channel means that it's inside the set of quantum channels, yes? And then we can always make beta zero. So, in some sense, you can say that beta can be made zero for almost all channels, I mean, apart from channels of measure zero. Okay. And in particular, you can show explicit bounds for various physically relevant, uh, physically relevant, uh, sorry, physically relevant uh, noise models. Okay. But you can say, okay, often it is it is like this, but maybe there are some also interesting cases where this beta cannot be made zero, okay? Or at least to a good approximation, it is not zero. So, for example, you have some dominant noise for which beta cannot be made zero, and this noise is actually relevant in some uh, time scale or, or, or some, I don't know. Okay, in your experimental situation. So then it may be interesting to ask what happens if this Hamiltonian is not inside this span, and can then Heisenberg limit be uh, achieved? Okay, and this was <coughs> actually conjectured by us in this paper by 2017, but the general construction uh, of this quantum error correcting code that achieves this was given in this paper from 2018. Uh, and very recently, there is another paper which somehow, again, a bit generalizes this, this, this consideration. But anyway, the idea is very simple, that if this Hamiltonian doesn't belong to this space spanned by this Ki, Ki, dagger Kj, 
then we can apply quantum error correcting idea correcting all the noise but because hamiltonian is not inside this space some part of unitary evolution will remain intact so we will like remove all the transformations related with these Krauss operators but because hamiltonian is not inside this space some part of the unitary will be preserved and it will give us like noiseless free rotation which which will result in heisenberg scale so for example if you consider qubit rotation plus dephasing okay then what what do we have we have hamiltonian which is proportional to sigma z and we have two Krauss operators identity and sigma z okay with some coefficients so then <coughs> of course <coughs> hamiltonian is inside this one and we cannot have heisenberg scaling and our precision will scale like uh, one over square root of n okay and not one over n and that's it and we can only win some constant factor gains thanks to quantum physics. But if we have uh, this perpendicular dephasing, for example, or actually it could be dephasing along arbitrary other axes than, <laughs> than sigma z, then our Hamiltonian is sigma z, our Krauss operators are identity and sigma x, <coughs> And now you can see by, by multiplying identity and sigma x with each other, you cannot get sigma z. Okay, so your Hamiltonian doesn't belong to this span, and it gives you a hint that maybe Heisenberg scaling is possible. And actually, in these papers, it was proven the general construction how to construct an error correcting code that gives you this. And I'll just show you the code for this particular example because this is very simple. So this perpendicular dephasing. Okay. So we imagine that we have this our channel and we will <coughs> interrupt it with some error correcting procedure. Okay, this EEC, which will make use of um, some ancilla. Actually, we just need one qubit ancilla. And, and we prepare the entangled state 0, 0, plus 1, 1 with some phase, which is any phase. Okay. And we now observe that when we perform unitary on this state, okay, it rotates the first qubit. <clears throat> and I don't know what I, okay, yes. No, it, it it gives us the phase yes of uh, to this state to this state uh, one and zero uh, relative phase, and it keeps us inside the subspace spanned by zero zero plus minus one one. Okay, it will not flip our qubit. Yeah? We just give us some relative phase. While if we look at our noise, it has identity which which does nothing and it's okay, but the error operation, this is this bit flip, it will move us to this orthogonal space span by zero, one plus minus one zero. And of course, because this is exactly orthogonal space, we can correct this error, okay? Because then it satisfies like Neil Laflamme error correcting condition that the error moves us to orthogonal subspace without affecting anything uh, between the states and we can then go back to the original subspace by applying the inverse operation to the error so we can detect the error by projecting on the space and then correct the error so in, okay explicitly the error correcting operation will be just we project either on this space e or space c okay so we have two projectors and our CP map representing this error correcting procedure is projection on one of these spaces. And if we project on space E, we do nothing. If we project on space E, we perform bit flip. Okay. So this is the most simple error correcting protocol you can imagine. And this will work here. Okay, but but you can also generalize this to arbitrary uh, situations. Um, so uh, as far as I remember, those schemes they worked like if you could 
uh, like interact with the system very often, let's say, right? Okay. Here, uh, okay, so the, yes, last time I was talking about these things, I was using this lean black picture and like more physical picture where we have like the, the quantum master equation and we and we evolve it at very short times and so on and so on. Here, I prefer to use like gate approach. I'm not discussing time evolution. And as you see, because here we can split, we, we have this uh, noise part and this unitary part like split, mm -hmm. we don't have this problem. So actually okay. here, here I could say that, okay, I don't care. I mean, it can be long rotation and, and strong uh, decoherence, but because they, they are split, like one acts first, the other acts later, then I can do it. But, but of course, in reality, the true physical model would be like this, that I would have this perpendicular dephasing acting simultaneously with phase rotation. And then indeed, I would need to do it fast because otherwise, if I evolve it rigorously for a longer time, the model will no longer be like this. <laughs> it will no longer be like perpendicular dephasing plus rotation, but something more complicated. Okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so in the end, if we do all this, <laughs> our scheme uh, yields an effective noiseless free unitary evolution. Uh, so actually in this model, we simply go back to like ideal rotation. If the noise was not strictly perpendicular, but a bit tilted, we would have also unitary rotation, but at a bit slower speed. Okay, it will not be exactly the same unitary rotation as before, but a bit <coughs> slower but still Heisenberg scaling could be achieved. Okay, so, so this is the first part. So maybe there are some questions uh, at this point. I've got one if I can. Uh, I, I can barely hear. Okay, let me adjust my microphone. Okay. <laughs> One sec. Mm. Tomek, maybe write the question. I can read it if you want. Or you can try to shout. Uh, is it okay now? <laughs> Okay, maybe try to just speak very loudly. Okay, so... Uh, oh, it's okay. Okay, cool. Uh, my question is, uh, you've said before that you are uh, interrupting the quantum channel and I'm uh, with this correction scheme or yes. this... Uh, and I'm not quite sure what, what does it mean to interrupt the channel? Uh, is it application uh, after the channel or, or what does it mean? Yes, okay. So, so I assume that my channel, which is here denoted by this big epsilon phi, this is quantum channel that contains both rotation and dephasing. This is like a quantum channel which I cannot divide, okay? This is like given, it's like a black box. But I can apply arbitrary operations before or after, and this I mean like I interrupt the procedure where I using these channels many times. So I'm using these channels n times and I can put some arbitrary operations between each use, but a single channel is not cut. It's like- Okay, okay. okay. I got it, thank you. Okay. Good, so, so this is basically the story of one direction. So what quantum metrology then how quantum metrology benefits from error correcting field. And it benefits by getting some explicit protocols, uh, which allow us to have, to reach, for example, Heisenberg scaling and, and, and uh, okay. 
and and uh, and we are happy. Now we can now ask: Can quantum metrology give something back? So can can we tell something about quantum error correcting codes using quantum metrology <coughs> metrological bound? So intuitively, maybe it is possible in case of noise models where quantum metrological bounds tell, tell us that we cannot reach Heisenberg limit. Because in this kind of noise, quantum bounds are, metrological bounds are quite strong. Okay? Because if they tell us you cannot reach Heisenberg limit, it means they are strong. If they tell us, okay, in principle you can, then okay, they don't say anything interesting. So, so this is a hint. So now, together with Oleg Kubica, we have identified a problem where we were able to show something non-trivial, what we can say about things which are interesting. Uh, for people working in quantum error correction using quantum metrological tools. So the, so the field is related with the concept of transversality and fault, toler fault tolerance and transversality. So if you, if you are in quantum error correct, correction ideas, you know that, okay, it's not enough to propose some quantum error correcting code and be happy because you have to think how this code will actually behave in some bigger structures, like in a whole algorithm, okay? So for example, if a given error correcting code have some level of errors, it's very important also how these errors will propagate if you combine this error correcting structure in some bigger structures. Or you, I mean, you build some layers of error correcting structures. Yes? You build from smaller and then you build bigger, and you, you want to control how the errors propagate, because if they propagate in an uncontrolled way, then you cannot guarantee anything reasonable uh, goes out in the end. And that's the idea of transversality in quantum error correcting codes, uh, which which amounts to a statement that when we use some quantum error correcting codes, which means we have some logical qubits which we encode in many physical qubits or physical subsystems. <clears throat> so then we can ask, <clears throat> how do we represent logical operations? And transversality property, transversality property, means that logical operation is represented by a product of physical operation on our physical subsystem, okay? So this U bar is our logical, okay, it's a representation of the logical operation on a physical, on physical systems, and we want it to be a product of unitary. <coughs> Why is it, is it desirable? Because then <coughs> if we do like this and error happens, on one qubit, then we will not propagate this error to other neighboring qubits, okay? And in this way, we can better uh, track how errors, uh, it, how errors affect the computation and, and the whole algorithm. Whereas if our unitary was represented by some collective unitary on many qubits, a single error on a qubit could translate to some error on many qubits, okay? Yes. Uh, so, Arthur, can I ask something? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I think in the current hardware, this this error model, when like error happens on a single site, it's uh, like I mean, it's not satisfied, right? So, so you have crosstalk errors, and just errors themselves, like themselves, uh, like affect. Inherently, many sides. It seems. I mean, I'm not super expert okay. on this, but this but, is what. Yeah. How, like, how this notion then uh, is it still, let's say, legit? Is it still meaningful? This notion for this other for more okay. general class of errors when you so, have some. Okay. So yeah. so uh, uh, I'm not an expert, but I think 
that still these errors in real devices, they are local in the sense that only like nearest neighbors or second nearest neighbors have these crosstalks, yes? Mm -hmm. So that there is some locality structure there. So yeah. it's good probably to use codes that also preserve this locality structure, even if it's not perfectly mm -hmm. satisfied, okay? So this would be my, my answer to this. I don't know, maybe Oleg can add something more clever. Um, yes, yeah, so actually, so, um, even, so if you have correlations in your noise, and then your logical operations um, include uh, multi-qubit gates, then uh, the noise becomes even more uh, difficult to correct. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, um, this type of uh, uh, logical operation is uh, the most benign, and it doesn't really make your noise harder to correct. So uh, that's basically it. Yeah. So, so the conclusion is that it's desirable in all cases, maybe except of completely delocalized noise. I mean, if noise have no structure, no local structure, yes? This is probably the only case where this is not desirable. Okay. And then there comes a bad news. It's called Nihilistin theorem that says for any non trivial local error correcting quantum code, the set of transversal logical unitaries is not universal. So that you have some code. And for example, your face, I don't know, you're some, I don't know, knot gate or some Hadamard gate is transversal. Okay, so you can encode Hadamard gate in a transversal way. But this theorem tells you that you cannot have a universal set of gates encoded in a transversal way. So that all the operations effectively can be encoded in a transversal way. So you can have some subset of gates, but not a universal set of gates can be encoded in a transversal way. Okay, so this is a bad news, but uh, okay, from what I understand, it's not a killing news, it's just a news that tells you you have to do some tricks and include some non-transversal gates, which you have to analyze then a bit more carefully in terms of error propagation, but it's doable. Uh, can I ask something? So this universality here, is it about computational universality or yes. can it be also, uh, so it also disqualifies encoded universality, right? What, what, what kind of, I didn't understand? Like encoded, encoded universality when you have- Encoded. Like, you know, imagine you can just perform real transformations and then you can, Use that. Uh, so uh, to do full touch computation, but with some encoding. Uh, so, so by encoding, you mean restricting to some subset of unitaries? Some or? subset, let's say that you know. Although, like formally, you don't have full unitary group, you have some some group which, okay. let's say effectively can do you the like full-fledged quantum computations to say some stuff. Michael, Michael, effectively when you have encoded universality, you have another layer of error correction or kind of another layer of code. Mm -hmm. And then you are with respect to the overall code, still the knill is still theorem applies. Okay. Okay. So thanks. Uh, I didn't understand fully the answer, but thank you. It seems very reasonable. Okay. So, uh, okay, so then, but there is another uh, deeper level of understanding this theorem. And we can agree that it's correct, this theorem, which tells you that you cannot have perfect error correcting codes. Okay, but then you can okay, ask, okay, let's say we allow for some errors in this error correcting code. So they are correcting, but I mean, they leave some, some, some errors. So then, it may be interesting to quantify it and to say how the imperfection of error correcting codes admitting universal and transversal set of gates scales with increasing resources. So by resources here we will mean 
uh, how many physical subsystems we use for encoding, or more precisely, how many physical subsystems with a given dimension we use. Okay, and uh, and this problem was addressed recently in these two papers I mentioned here, and uh, these papers are a bit long and difficult to read and uh, even the authors do not understand what's inside uh, which we learned with Oleg asking them some concrete questions <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, I'm exaggerating but but indeed it was so Oleg was asking two two guys being who, who are co-authors and he got different answers so <clears throat> Uh, so now we thought that that it would be nice to have a simple uh, proof using some metrological ideas of this approximate Easton Neal theorem. Okay. Basically, this approximate Easton Neal theorem uh, works with the so-called covariant error correcting code. So, so what is covariant error correcting code? If you imagine we have this logical qubit. And we perform some unitary logical operation on the on it, and then we encode it into physical qubits. So this this epsilon l to a means we encode logical qubit to many physical subsystems. Okay, covariance here will mean that we will obtain the same state if we swap uh, unitary with encoding. So if we first encode our logical qubit into uh, physical subsystems and then apply uh, unitaries on physical subsystems. So if it is so, then you can, uh, you can see that this covariance guarantees transversality, okay? Because we have like, by covariance, we automatically have this, uh, this transversality satisfied. And now, if we would, if we add to it that it should work, for example, for all SU2 rotations, we would also have uh, universality, at least for a single qubit operation, guarantee. So somehow this covariance is a stronger assumption than transversality and universality, because from covariance it follows transversality and universality. But somehow these people, again, in the same paper, they somehow argue that these are equivalent notions. Okay, so that, uh, that basically by considering covariant error correcting codes, we, we do not really impose some stronger constraint than we would do if we just talk about transversality and universality. Uh, Okay, I, I'm not sure about this statement, but uh, this is what I understood from, from this paper. And Oleg, I think, is also not sure about it, but uh, this is somehow our uh, understanding at the moment. I mean, so just to be clear, understanding is that it's, uh, do you believe that the state, like, equivalence between this? Uh, yeah, so. Let's say so, so for, or yeah, so, so for example, uh, I understand that they, they claim that if you prove something for covariant error correcting codes, it implies for all transversal and universal codes, yes? Mm -hmm. So if you prove that something is impossible with covariant error correcting codes, it is impossible with transversal universal codes. Yeah. Okay, so just, uh, okay, I'm going to ask something that's probably kind of related because Quantum computation, as far as I understand, it's like not about continuous groups per se, but it's about yes. like concatenation of like poly many gate. Yes, that's that's exactly the point. What? That's exactly the point. So all the theorems in the end use the uh, Lie structure, Lie Lie group structure, and Lie algebra structure, but to reach it, you have to show that computational schemes, they really are somehow equivalent to this analysis on the level of continuous groups. 
Uh -huh. And I understand that there are some subtleties because you have to show that, okay, this, this criticization is not really uh, making such a big difference because it's arbitrary small discretization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so this is the basic argument I understand, but I, I would not uh, give my head for this. Uh, mm -hmm. So I see. Because, okay, so so for to make things simpler, we will just focus here on U1 covariance. So we will consider this logical transformations and these physical transformations just to be some e to i t theta. Yes, so like theta will be our scalar parameter, and we will have some logical generator TL and some physical generators TAI for each physical subsystem. Okay, so this is this covariant error correcting codes with U1 group in mind. Uh, this will correspond to such schemes. Okay, and why, why do we consider this? Of course, as you can imagine, because we want to make connection with metrology where, where we exactly have very similar structures. Okay. Um, so that's not just what you're saying is extremely interesting. I just wanted, okay, in principle, you've got like seven minutes more. We can push it a bit. Okay. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I'm looking at the clock. Uh, I, I'm, I'm close to the main point no, and then is... to finish. Okay, so now I just want to show you why we choose this approach because and how we connect these structures of error correction and metrology. So this will be just a single slide with our figure from the paper. So this is this uh, error correcting scheme. So we have this logical operation we have this encoding into this physical systems. Now, we have some noise. This NA, NAN is local noise acting on our physical systems. So you see, uh, green things are logical, gray things are physical. Okay? So noise is physical. Then we have this recovery operation, which is supposed to correct the errors. And then we are fine, we are back to our logical qubit on which we can apply again, for example, the same unitary and so on, okay? And in this way, we can perform some logical unitary many times, correcting and performing and, and, and so on. And then in the end, we can perform the measurement on our qubit in which this parameter theta is encoded, okay? Now, thanks to covariance property, we can now move this unitary rotation inside the physical system. So they become gray. Okay? They act on, on the physical system. Okay, so we now use this uh, error, uh, this covariance property. So, you know, it's funny because I show this presentation in inverse order than it's in the paper. I show it from C, B, and now A, because we, we spend a lot of time with Oleg uh, discussing which order is better for the paper, to start with quantum error correction or to start with metrology and which direction we should present. And, and in the end, I think I, I let Oleg choose and he chose the different <laughs> order, but when I presented it myself, I choose the order I wanted from the beginning. So, so, then, so then in the end, if you look at this scheme, you realize that effectively, from the point of view of estimating theta, this is some particular quantum metrological scheme where you have some state preparation, you have this unitary gates acting on our systems, you have some noise, and then this recovery encoding is basically our control operations and so on. So that you can look at this whole thing as an instance of a general adaptive metrological protocol. And in this way, you can say that quantum error correcting code cannot be better than what is told by the quantum metrological bounds on how well you can estimate theta. Okay? Because we know that within this most general metrological protocol, theta cannot be estimated better than something. And if our error correcting protocol was too good, this final state theta here would be too raw tilde theta 
would be too good and it would encode too much information about people. Okay? So this is basic idea that now using metrological bounds, we can say that quantum error correcting codes cannot be better than something. Okay, so now the theorem, and because this is a short talk, I will not discuss the proof. I will just show the theorem. So the theorem is basically all the elements you have already. So we have some U1 covariant uh, transversally encoding code, encoding logical gates E2 minus I theta TL, and we have some local noise. Yes, noise, which is the product of local noises. And we say that the error of the code, so this epsilon quantifies some kind of, in some way, error of the code. I will just give the exact definition in a moment, but this is some kind of error for the code. It is lower bounded by, okay, something which is just the spread of eigenvalues of this logical generator. So this delta TL is just the difference between maximum and minimum uh, eigenvalue of TL because it just gives us like the scale. Yes, it just gives us the scale for theta uh, rotation. But the important thing is that in the denominator you have bound Fisher information, which is a bound for a corresponding metrological bound uh, protocol. So this F arrow is just your fam familiar expression for the bound, but calculated for this channel, yes? For channel where we act with this uh, U and noise on this physical subsystem. And this here, you have the sum of these operator norms of alpha. Okay. Uh, so, so this is the theorem. And now what is this epsil epsilon? So what, so we say that this code uh, is epsilon, I mean that this, we have this epsilon correcta correctability, which means that in that distance between the error correcting channel and the identity, an error corrected channel and the identity channel is less than epsilon. In what sense? So our channel I is encoding, noise decoding. And if it was ideal channel, it would be identity. Okay, it is not identity. And we quantify uh, this error by saying that the distance between uh, this channel and the identity is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so we know that it's closer to the identity channel than epsilon. And the distance we quantify using the so-called worst case entanglement fidelity between quantum channels. So if you have two quantum channels, you act with each of these channels, which is extended by identity channel on the reference system, you act on some arbitrary entangled state between your uh, space and this reference space. And then you compare the fidelity between this output states and you minimize over input states. So this is the worst case, how these channels can differ at the output. Okay, and this is called worst case entanglement fidelity of quantum channels. And the distance is defined as a square root of one minus this fidelity. Okay, so this is like the formal way how we quantify this, this, this distance. So, our theorem is not very difficult, but it's okay. It, it takes like maybe two pages to, quant to, to, to get this relation between this distance measure and the Fisher information. Okay, this is the, the most important like technical element here. Conceptually, it's very simple because I, I told you, but technically you have to relate this Fisher information and this distance measure in a quantitative way. Okay, and and we did it somehow. Okay, so the ex example. So for example, you can consider now error correction in presence of loss, because we know metrological bounds for loss, and they're very simple. So you imagine that you have these physical systems which experience loss, 
which means that with probability pi, you can lose i subsystem. Okay? And now you can derive uh, metro, sorry, you can derive the upper bound for quantum fissure information. Maybe you remember when I was writing this uh, bound for lossy interferometer, there was like one minus eta over eta, or eta over one minus eta, or something like this. Yes. So this is basically the same formula. In 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 interferometers with eta, we say what is the probability of not losing a photon, and here we say with p what is the probability of losing atom or something. And then we have the square of this eigenvalue spread, which again just is due to this rescaling of this rotation. So this is the upper bound for this uh, for this system. Uh, this 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 Fisher information bound. And then we can plug it into this theorem, and we get this bound on epsilon. <laughs> but so so this is already almost the end. But now, mm, this is not yet really very useful because it depends on these generators. We have this eigenvalue spreads of these physical generators. And basically, we have no constraints on them. Because if you have U1 rotation, you encode it, but physical systems can rotate arbitrary fast. There is no constraint that physical systems should have generators which are somehow comparable to generators on logical system or something. Okay? So that's why we really don't exactly have explicit formula here. We just have this formula in terms of this generator. But now we can imagine that we, we consider like uh, error correcting code with full SU2 covariance. So now we, we think that we could rotate using different logical generators and we want to have the same property. And here again, we could rotating with some different generators, we could derive the same metrological bound, okay, if we rotate in other direction, because loss is invariant under SU2, okay? And if we do it, then, for example, if we fix our logical uh, generators to be like spin one half generators. So we say that uh, the difference between eigenvalues is one, because it's plus one half and minus one half. Then we know that if we have a full SU2 representation in some subspace of dimension D, we cannot have generators which are arbitrarily large, because they are limited by like maximum angular momentum that you can fit into some given d-dimensional space. And basically, the maximum eigenvalue spread is then two times maximum angular momentum you can have, which basically means that two times this angular momentum is dimension of your subsystem minus one. Okay, and then we can plug it into this formula above, and we have a bound which is given in terms of dimensions of the subsystem we use. Okay. And that's now more interesting because we have an explicit formula that error cannot be smaller than something that, as you see, depends on these dimensions of the subsystems and how many subsystems you have. So it's case like one over number of, of subsystems you use. Okay, so that's the end. So basically, this is the take home message. We have this one arrow that goes from left to right, which that error correcting people can help us to think of protocols in quantum metrology, while error correction, while quantum metrology can tell us something about bounds on quality and of covariant error correcting codes. And just last thing, very recently there was another paper by people from <laughs> this Zhu and Yang, Jiang from Yale. They are somehow hunting us because with, with the previous paper on this, on this metrological bounds, like 
three years ago, it was the same. We published a paper and they published their paper two months later. And it's the same here. <laughs> we publish a paper and they publish a paper one month later. Uh, and, uh, and usually it's like that they publish a bit better paper than ours. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, it seems that it's the same thing here that they have, at least they claim that they have a bit stronger bar. I'm not so sure if it's true because I did not go through the paper in detail, but somehow they claim that using the same approach, they get a bit better bound. Okay, I don't know exactly, but they, they claim so. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anton, for a very uh, nice and inspiring talk. Uh, yeah, we have uh, okay. We, we have time for for questions, comments. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so can you comment a little bit on the scaling on the last slide? Uh, because yes. it's not like super clear for me what it means exactly, because you have also probabilities of errors there, right? Yeah, so, so the, scaling, uh, the scaling on last slide was... Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> That's probably scaling. the first one. Yeah. You, mean, you mean this one, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the scaling is like, as you see, one over number of subsystems you use times square of the dimension. And uh, we don't claim that this bound is tight. In fact, right. uh, this, this other people, they said, I think, they said that they have like square root of this thing here. So a tighter bound. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, we with uh, Oleg, at some point, we also obtained a tighter bound with this square root. <laughs> but this was because we assumed something which later on we thought was not really justified in full generality. So I suspect that maybe these other people, they are a bit, um, they maybe, okay, either they are very clever and they did it, or they also missed this thing, we missed at some point, uh, because at some point we had a bound which scaled like one over square root of number of subsystems. Oh, okay. Yes, but, but then, was it a mistake? Uh, yeah, yeah oh. it, it seems to us that it was a mistake in the sense that we had to assume something about the structure, something additional about the structure of this error correcting code. And, and without this assumption, uh, we could derive this one and we realized that it's maybe not tight because on the way we had to use a triangle inequality. And, uh, and this might make this bound not tight. Uh, so, so, so maybe the other bound is true and tighter, but uh, this is just to be, to be seen. Uh, Right. Um, so, uh, can I ask, uh, what uh, did you think? What, of course, you thought about it, but uh, do you have any clues? What happened actually in the uh, in the scenario when, um, like, you 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 don't uh, you don't lose this Heisenberg uh, scaling, right? In principle, and like on the methodological side, in principle you have a capacity to do like error uh, correction right to, to recover it then would this trans, uh, like translate to on the on the side of, uh, of error correction so to to be able to get better fidelities let's say of uh, for those uh, channels effectively so okay can you repeat so in case we can achieve heisenberg scaling yes yeah, yeah like if on the methodological side you can achieve the yes. methodological scaling like for these types of noise, can you then, on the side of this encoding, covariant encoding, can you then uh, construct codes that that give a good fidelity? Like yes. that still prevent those bounds that you just showed. Yeah. So so then these bounds here, we would not be able to derive these bounds, 
Yeah. So, so okay, this bounds. So, so okay, hold this approach of deriving this bounds on this uh, covariant error correcting codes. They only work when we cannot achieve Heisenberg scaling, like with losses. But as you say, if we can, then this bounds would be trivial, like epsilon greater than zero or something like this, greater or equal than zero. Um, uh, and this is, for example, you can easily understand this by the example which I showed before, like this perpendicular dephasing, because perpendicular dephasing is just this bit flip noise, yes? And uh, these logical gates were like phase gates. And then uh, basically this error correcting code that uh, we showed when we discussed this metrological protocol uh, protects you against this, this bit flip error but also works for arbitrary, like logical operation, yes? Uh, sure, 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 like, okay. My question At was- least from this class, from this U1 class. Yeah. Sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, Marcos, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was about to ask kind of two things. The one thing is, what exactly do you mean in the error correction setting by loss? Do you know the position or since when you apply gates or whatever, you have to act on something. So do you yeah. replace it by a maximally mixed state or do you have the information that the qubit has been lost? Yeah, okay, so, so in our model, our model of loss is like this, that uh, on each subsystem, we act with Krauss operators that either keep the qubit unchanged or, or the system unchanged, or it uh, changes the state of the qubit to some plug state. Like we, we have some... You, you so it's the we, erasure we, channel, not the loss channel. Yes, we formally add some state which represents, okay, I am lost. Okay, and... No, and so okay, so that is what I call the quantum erasure channel. Yes, okay, so this will be quantum erasure with, with a flag that this system was lost. But the, 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 that is the nature of quantum erasure. You get the information that it has been erased. Yes, yes. But uh, so, so this is our model. The erasure channel is what I have seen so far. But I was wondering if you now go to depolarizing channel or some other channels, yes. can you still derive any bounds? Yes, so, so this is the point. Okay, I should stress this. Metrological bounds, can be derived very easily for very generic noise. So for example, in our paper, we also show the bounds for depolarizing noise, okay, which is, which is basically, okay, in some sense, from metrological perspective, you can show that uh, uh, this bound uh, is uh, also valid for depolarizing noise, where P is this probability of replacing your state with identity. Okay? So uh, okay, I, then actually my intuition is that uh, the code should perform better if you have the side information about the losses, how you call yeah, it. Yeah. So, but so if you I get the same sure. bounds, I, yeah, yes. I so dare so to see. say then one of the bounds, namely the one for the losses is too weak. Yes, okay, so I don't, I don't say this bound is tight, but I just say that we can derive bound for depolarizing noise, which is in principle tighter than this one. For FISA, I mean for FISA, FISA information, we get a tighter bound for FISA information. Okay, so smaller right hand side, so then larger right hand side for epsilon. Uh, and we have this bound in our paper, at least uh, written analytically for a qubit case. Okay. For a general yes. uh, d-dimensional case, we can easily obtain this bound numerically, but we don't have analytical formula for this bound for depolarizing noise, but we also can show that this bound will always also be valid. So, for depolarizing noise, we can have a tighter bound, but this bound also will be valid for depolarizing noise. 
and we can show it uh, within this methodological approach rigorously. So, so maybe quick follow up. Uh, I, from what you talked about, uh, I don't think you are constructing codes, do you? No. No. So since some don't. of the papers they were essentially constructing codes for the situation of erasure channel. But then effectively, you know which are the qubits which have been untouched, and then you kind of can read off the rotation from that one. Mm -hmm. But if you have the situation of the depolarizing channel, then I don't see that that kind of technique uh, by reading off the rotation or whatever kind of methodological quantity you have from the subset of untouched systems is that that no longer works. And, Therefore, I don't see how one could get to codes for the depolarizing channel, why for all this lost channel, or as I, said, I, as I would call it, the Rachel channel, it's more obvious that you still have some information and you're sure that the information is left in that part. So, so as you say, we don't construct uh, the codes. So, no, we, so I, it, I it's fair enough, but I was just as curious. Yes, I, I, I cannot comment on this. Because I mean, okay, we just wanted to make this connection, and as 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 from your question, I see. I think the power of this connection is that really, at least to get some bound, I'm not sure if it's a tight bound. That's true, but to get a some bound, I can really use very uh, like general approach from this metrology, which allows me to really take any kind of noise, and. I know that these bounds for metrological properties, that they are tight. Okay, from the point of view of metrology, these bounds are asymptotically tight in the sense for if, we, if I have many repetitions and so on. But now I use them in this derivation where, okay, I, I'm not sure about the tightness of the final bound, but I can do it for any kind of noise model, basically. Okay, yeah, thanks. Just maybe taking over where you finish, uh, Rafael. So those meteorological bounds are typically for single parameter estimation, right? Where you have yes. uh, just fixed information. So it seems just intuitive. <coughs> it's intuitive to me, at least, that if you, if one had analogous bounds for multi-parameter meteorology, that would be closer and maybe tighter, like to to the situation that you are describing here, right? With, with SU two. Yes, but the point is, will they be tighter just by some coefficient, or they will be something more, more like in scaling properties? Uh, so, so I would guess maybe there is only some coefficient difference then. Okay. Uh, any more questions? We had already quite some discussion with Rafa, but any more questions, comments? If not, um, yeah, let's thank the speaker again for a very nice talk. Thanks, Rafa. Okay. Thank you. Thanks yes. a lot.